at the risk of alienating my audience, I've had a good, uh, let's say, 18 years following the Boston team. <laughs> it's been a good run. So thank you, David. Appreciate it. And thank you all for spending a few minutes today. Um, as David mentioned, we're going to be talking today about something that's near and dear to my heart. He mentioned, he kind of gave you my, 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 um, my whole curriculum vitae going back to my, my previous jobs. But one thing of note there, I did work in the, uh, in the space of uh, the user experience and user interface design space. So design thinking has always been really important to me. And I've been really interested in, over the last few years in thinking about how design thinking could solve some challenges that we see at Real Story Group and that big problem that we see with people picking the wrong technology for the wrong job, okay? And so that's what we're gonna be talking about today. So just to give you some quick background, quick perspective, Real Story Group, what we do, we're fundamentally an industry analyst firm. So we spend our days looking at technologies, figuring out what they're good at and what they're not so good at, where they're a good fit, where they're not such a good fit. So a little bit like the Foresters and Gartners of the world, but our model's a little bit different, and some people call us the consumer reports of the digital technology, uh, digital, mar digital marketing technology and digital workplace spaces, okay? So what, what that means is we produce research on a little over 160 different vendors that are out there, and we have subscribers to that research. We have a bunch of tools that help people get the right shortlist, and, and compare vendors head to head, as what, and we do some consulting and help people pick the right products for the right job. I mentioned that we're, we're the consumer reports of a certain space. Well, this is the space. Um, at this conference, we're, we're largely talking about internally focused digital workplace technologies, so things like enterprise collaboration technology, uh, Office 365 and SharePoint is big at this conference. Uh, you might be talking about document management, but we also, we also look at technologies more externally focused on a, on a marketing perspective as well. But the, the common theme here is that these technologies are all about managing content through a life cycle and, and getting that right content to the right point in time and ultimately getting it to, to the, right, the, right, uh, the right person to, so that you can uh, achieve your goals. I'm gonna use that consumer reports analogy just one more time because it's, it's really, really important uh, to understanding Real Story Group and our role in this, in this space. And it's quite frankly, it's something we're very proud of. We do not work for any of the vendors that, that we cover. So you hear us talking about technologies all the time, but we don't work for software vendors in any way. So we don't advise software vendors on their product strategy. We don't speak at their events. We don't write white papers for them. We don't take uh, lavish trips or dinners from them. It's, it's really something that, we're, that is ingrained in everything that we do. But what that level of independence allows us to do is truly sit on the buyer side of the table. So, and we like to say, because we're not beholden to software vendors, we're able to give you as potential technology buyers, what we like to call the real story. And that's where our name comes from. David mentioned too that we, in the last year, we wrote this book, The Right Way to Select Technology, and I'm gonna be talking about what's in this book today uh, quite a bit, but I've also been given permission from the publisher to give away a few copies, so if anyone's interested, um, just write your name and email on, on a sheet, and we'll do a little raffle after, and I think I have, I have three copies I can give away today, okay? So. There's been a ton of stats out there about technology projects and, and their success or perceived lack of success or actual lack of success. And you know, some say 60%, some say 70%, some say 40. We like to say about half of technologies are deemed failures. Now, why is that? I bet a few of you have been through the through a few of these technology projects. Anyone been through a failed technology project before? Yeah, we all have, right? There are lots of reasons for that, right? There's lots of reasons with that, things that, lots of things that can go, go wrong in, in an, during an implementation. There's lots of things that can go wrong during a rollout. There's lots of things that can go on during just trying to keep things on, on pace after you launch something, right? But nothing pains me more than seeing a project doomed to fail because someone picked the wrong project for the wrong job at the outset. And that's what we see on an ongoing basis, and it was the reason why we said there's got to be a better way to do this. This is another view of the, of the world that we live in. 
And this is kind of our, you know, if I look at those, those nine different marketplaces that we're covering, these are all the vendors that are pl playing in here. And you have, a, you have some really important hubs in the middle from some of the biggest names in software. And then you have lots of best of breed options on the, on the outskirts of these lines. And I show you this not to just give you an eye chart or, or some, some fun little um, tchotchke that you can hang up in your, in your cube. We do have copies of this if you'd like. If you'd like to take one home, I'm happy to give you one. But what I want to show you here is part of the reason that people pick the wrong software is because you have so many options. There's new vendors coming out every day. Trust me, this is my job to keep track of this. It's really hard because there's new challengers every day. There's old, old challengers putting new marketing spin on old products, and it's really confusing. Okay, So that's, that's contributing to the problem. But fundamentally, I will say, options are good. From a buyer's perspective, it is good to have options. We'll talk about how we sift through this to make the right decisions. So before we can talk about the right way to select technology, we've got to look at the wrong way to select technology. And I hope you'll indulge me with, with some examples that I have here, kind of the traditional methods of selecting technology that lead these projects astray. So the first traditional method that I want to call to your attention is something that we call blind love. So this can happen in a variety of different ways, but where I see it happen all the time is at a conference like this, you all come and say, hey, we, we have from some issues. We, we know we need some new technology. Let's go look at the vendors in the, in the showroom out there. And guess what? They all look better than what you have back at the office, right? So you walk around that showroom floor and say, oh my god, this, this has to be good. What, what can, this has got to be better than what we have. Let's just bring this in. OK, that's one way of doing it. But what you see on that show floor doesn't always translate to the real world, as I'm sure you're aware. The second one I like to call is happiness is a warm set of binders. Anyone gone through a traditional RFP process? Anyone? Yeah. So what do you do? You go around your organization, talk to a bunch of people across the organization, try to gather up every single requirement that you can, put it in an Excel spreadsheet, take that Excel spreadsheet, put it in an RFP, send it over the wall to a short list of vendors, and what do you get back? Something like that. I'm telling you, don't do that. That way is broken. That's the old way of doing it. We're not doing that anymore. It's a waste of time for you. It's a waste of time for the vendors. It's a waste of time for everyone. Next one is my cousin Vinny. This can also happen at conferences like this or you know, maybe some, some peer industry groups that you might belong to or even, even you know, cocktails with the neighbors. You, know, you start to talk about your jobs and, and what you're doing, and, and, and the person you're talking to might say, oh, we had that problem. We just used. Vendor X, Y, and Z, you should too. And I'm here to tell you what's good for one organization might not be good for another organization. Next uh, traditional method is called the family car method. Now, I don't know about you all, but when I first got my driver's license, I told my parents I wanted something red as my first car. And what they came back and told me was like, oh, you're in luck, because our family car was red. And our family car was a minivan. And that's what I would be driving as my first car. Now, this is how I, li I like to say how people all the time have this, have this technology issue that they realize. And they say, let's go to IT and tell them our problem. And IT says, well, why don't you just use Office 365 for that? We have it. You should use it. It's free. We've already paid for it, right? Anyone familiar with that resonate? Oh, yeah. Anyone ever bet on the ponies? Do we have any degenerates, safe space? Um, it's OK. It's OK. Well, for those of you who are pretending you haven't, well, here's how it works. You walk into the racetrack. The first thing they do as you're walking up to the window is they give you this little racing form. This racing form gives you a little snippet of information about each horse. And you are supposed to go up to the window and make a decision on who you're going to put your hard-earned money on based on this little snippet of information. This is the, akin to you deciding who to put on your shortlist by looking at a single snapshot view of the marketplace and looking at who's in the upper right-hand quadrant. It's just a little snippet of information. We don't know what logic put that, put that vendor in the upper right hand of the quadrant. Um, or, or people do a Google search and say, well, the vendors who have come up highest should probably make it on my short list. Well, unless you're choosing an SEO vendor, I would say no. The last 
one I'll, I'll present is something we call the implementer first um, method of choosing software. So many of you work for organizations, I'm sure, that you have a relationship with an implementer or an agency in-house, and it's not uncommon for you to go to a, an implementer and say, hey, we have this problem, who do you recommend that we use? And I'm here to tell you, it's a little bit like going to Jeep guys and asking them which car is right for you. They're probably gonna say the, the vendor that they know, right? And as a, having worked on that side of the house, you can, there's a lot of, of great systems integrators and implementers that truly call themselves independent, but as an implementer, you can only know a handful of products really well. And, and of course, when your client comes to you, you're probably gonna recommend one of those that you really know well, okay? So, ultimately, what I'm suggesting to you here today is to avoid those wrong ways of selecting technology and try to take, it, take the guessing out of this. How can we take the risk out of, out of this, this really important and oftentimes really expensive choice? This is where I come back to this notion of design thinking. And just a quick definition from Stanford, design thinking is a process and way of thinking through tough to solve problems. They also say it's a human-centered approach to innovation that draws from the designer's toolkit to integrate the needs of people, the possibilities of technology, and the requirements for business success. The folks at Stanford also did a lot of work into thinking about design thinking in, in, in five different, different phases. So in an empathy phase, a definition phase, an ideation phase, a prototyping phase, and a testing phase. And you know, as I, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, I had this, this user experience background and I've known about design thinking for some time. This is not a new concept. This has been around since the 70s and, and I've been thinking about this and, and then thinking about this technology problem where we see people picking the wrong technology over and over and over again. And we said, well, this, this process here is kind of like the process that when we see these technology selection projects go right, people are, doing, are, are truly doing these steps here. And so what we said is, let's take this process and map it to a traditional winnowing down process that, you, that everyone should go to when evaluating who is the right software vendor partner for us, okay? So ultimately what we're talking about here is finding a way to get to the right market, get, to, get from a long list of options to the right short list, find a way to really test those, that, those shortlisted vendors in a series of really more intimate steps until you're very sure that you have the right, the right partner going forward. Okay, well let's talk about that, let's break it down. So, empathy. So the first step here, and I'm gonna go back to that example of that, that, that happiness form set of binders. I don't want you to start any technology selection project by going out and, tr and canvassing your organization and trying to document every single requirement. There will be time for that. We're not designing the system in day one, okay? And that's, it's really tempting to, to go down that route. However, what I want you to do instead is to create some narrative scenarios that encompass the entire experience of what it is you're trying to create, okay? Don't focus on the laundry list of features, think about the entire experience. And we always say there's a bit of art and science here because you wanna be descriptive without being overly prescriptive as to how the solution should be. So describe your future way of working, but don't prescribe how it could work. So again, do not go out and try to design the, the system on day one. There will be time for that. Instead, I want you to, they, they warned me that this clicker is a little finicky, so I have to go like this. Um, instead, I want you to get into the heads of your employees as much as you can. And, and we, we like this, this reference model that when we talk about digital workplace, you put the employee at the center. It's so, it's, it's so tempting in today's day and age to think about technology as a, as a technology stack in, of just technologies, but what's missing from those, those stacks is the people. And so we want you to put people at the center, think about what applications those people need to, to work better um, and, and do their work in, in, the, in the best possible ways, and then think about the technology that, that supports that. If you do that, start with the people, you'll start to be able to think about 
okay, what do the, these people need at every step of the way to accomplish what they're trying to do? So when you get out of the mindset of requirements gathering and, and functional requirements gathering and start to say, how can we describe a future way of working, what you end up with is a narrative scenario. A narrative scenario that uses real people, real actors. I want you to really focus on real environments, whether they're working on a, a PC, a Mac, out in the field, on, at, at their desk, on their phone. Um, I want you to really talk about the type of content that they interact with on a daily basis, the type of interactions they have, the type of data they need to, to make decisions, and then describe that future way of working and, and start to describe a process of, of the way that communication happens in, in, a, in an ideal state. Those scenarios are the single most important foundational element to this process. If you get those scenarios right, we're gonna talk about those scenarios throughout this process and using that as the, as the fundamental piece that you're using to test, test, test at every step of this, this, this process going forward. Okay, so hopefully we've done some empathy there. We've, un, we've gotten into the heads of our, of our digital workplace users. We've created our stories. The next piece is to do some definition. And when we say definition in this, in this case, we're talking about make sure that we have the right short list in, in place. And so this is where it's also a little tricky and a lot of mistakes are made. It's very tempting to, to go out there and figure out and try to try to figure out who are the leaders, the best vendors in, in certain certain areas. People Google best collaboration tools all the time, best internet tools, best anything. And again, that's not going to get you to where you want. And part of the problem, again, there's so many options. And so many options that, where these lines are so blurry between, between what is a, um, an internet tool or a community tool or a document sharing, to, file sharing tool, um, document management tool, CMS. It's really, it's really blurry. And as analysts, you know, we spend our days trying to put boxes in, in circles around things and try to make sense of this world. But as a buyer, I, I, it, it's really hard to figure out even among the vendors that say they're one thing, they might, they might not actually be able to execute uh, on, on those things. They're just trying to get ahead of the marketing wave. So again, I don't want you to, to just look at single snapshot views of marketplaces. Now, I'm, I'm beating up on my analyst brethren here, but these, these, these diagrams and charts of, a, of the marketplace, they have a purpose. But when you're coming up with your shortlist, if you just look at the upper right-hand quadrant, you're going to be doing yourself a disservice. I see, have seen some of the most successful projects I've ever, uh, ever witnessed of a vendor that was down here being the absolute best fit for a, a certain scenario. And if, if they hadn't looked at that, if they had only looked in the upper right, they would never have considered this vendor, and that would have been a shame. Instead, as an alternative to that single snapshot view, you to turn your attention upon yourselves and figure out and ask yourselves what are you trying to do now I'm going to use collaboration as as a, a, a use case here and, and talk through this but when we talk about something like collaboration technology and, and and helping helping your organizations collaborate better and helping your users collaborate better in your organization that can mean a lot of different things to a lot a lot of, a lot of different people so you know, people at this conference, you know, knowledge-based management tends to be very rigid and structured, while enterprise networking is, is not rigid and structured and, and is a very different model than, than something like a knowledge base. And there's lots of gray areas in the middle where, you know, you're talking about external collaboration versus project collaboration, communi community type collaboration, innovation support around, around products and whatnot, social Q&A. So I want you to say, what is it, when we look at our own digital workplaces, what are we trying to do? Think about it from an application standpoint. And then I want you to go find products that were fundamentally built to solve those applications that, you, that you've identified as important to you. So as an alternative, I can tell you, when, when we're working with our clients, we use something that, that, we, that we built called Real Quadrant Tool. And here, what we, what we have, have kind of automated, it was saying, all right, 
tell us what's most important to you, rate it, give it, give it some weightings, and, and we'll match it up to, 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 some, to some analysis that says these products were fundamentally built to solve these, these challenges, okay? And we found that sales teams and marketers and vendors, they'll say that they're good at everything. But, what we, but when we do some digging, and we've done this, we've been around for 18 years doing this, and what we found is that vendors out there can usually say that they're really pretty good at, at about three of these different, different, um, different use cases. No one's good at all of them, right? And every vendor has a different three things that they that they were built to, to solve. And if you can align yourself with ones that were fundamentally built with, their, with your use cases in mind, your chances of success are going to be uh, huge, much, much, much greater. OK, so now we have our stories. We have our short list. What's next? Well, we, gotta, we have to get the vendors to prove that they're the best fit for us. Hopefully, we have a short list of vendors of all of which are perfectly viable options, but let's, let's, let's suss it out. So what we want to do as the, during the ideation phase is create a series of demonstrations where the vendors actually show you how their products meet your needs, not how they meet any of their other clients' needs, but how they meet your needs. Anyone ever sat in vendor demos? Vendor demo week? This is what I do for a living. That's me. No, I'm kidding. It's not me. Um, but the key to making a, to avoiding this situation where everyone's asleep in, that I've seen is how can we make those demonstrations as real as possible and as relevant as possible to your, your selection team? The worst thing that you can do is leave the vendor to their own devices and allow them to come in and give the same canned demonstration that they give everyone else. Because you know what? It's going to look slick, and it's going to look good, and it's going to work every time. And you just wasted all these people's time in that meeting across the week. And guess what? That's a pretty expensive week if you add that up, right? So instead, I want you to make them as real as you possibly can. So I think it goes without saying you want to make sure your team is represented at every single, every single uh, demonstration over the course of demo week. But here's where you want to really pre prescribe to these vendors how they should use their, their time during their demos. Don't let them come in and tell you what they're going to do. Say, we're, I want you to come in and give really short time box, um, 15 minutes for, for introductions. Give me a quick overview of your company because you know what? We already did our due diligence on, in, in making sure we had the right shortlisted vendors, vendors on the list. We already know your background. Spend the bulk of the time with us showing us our scenarios. So again, no canned demos. Demo the scenarios that you wrote. And then you, you force the vendors to come in and give the same scenarios in the same order day by day by day so that you're able to truly compare apples to apples to apples. It's a, it sounds so basic, but I can tell you so few organizations do this and, 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 and enforce the vendors to, to stick to this model. But those that do, it's such a much better use of your time. And you know, as you go through this process, after you see day one, it's really interesting. But, but day two, at the end of day two, you're able to say, well, which one do we like better? And then by day three, you're saying, OK, we have a, either a clear leader or at least a clear, some clear finalists. And this is your opportunity to, to not just let this be a, a one-way flow of information from the vendor to you. I really encourage you to make these, these demo days as interactive as you can. So I want you to ask, to you, during this period, ask the tough questions around pricing. We often sit on these for our clients and say, we're saying, well, that module wasn't in your, in your uh, proposal. You know, don't try to slide that in, in there. Or we, we challenge the vendors to really tell us how much effort it took to get their product to, to jump through some hoops. My colleague Tony likes to say, vendors don't always lie, but they don't tell you how much time, money, and ibuprofen it took to get their products to do what, it's try, what you were asking them to, to, to do. And, and that's what you really want to you wanna suss out. In today's technology, you can get technology to do anything for you, but as close as you can get it out of the box, the better off you're going to be. So next, 
let's assume we got through demo week, we all survived, and we get to the point where ideally you're, you either have a, a clear leader in the clubhouse, but in a, in a perfect world, I actually, actually want you to come up with your final two. Okay, and I want you to, to take your final two and say, we're gonna get you to the uh, final round and do something that we like to call a competitive proof of concept, or sometimes people call it a bake-off. Anyone ever done this? Yeah? Have you done it over like one week or two weeks? Six months? Yeah, and they can take any, any time, any length of time that's necessary, but if there's one thing I can say, that the, the people that spend time during this phase uh, doing the proof of concept and bake off correctly, you're eliminating so much risk out of, out of this, this decision, right? Because you're learning so much about what it's like to use this technology, but you're also learning what it's like to work with this partner. And they're learning, learning what it's like to work with you. And so those lessons are invaluable to, to learn before you sign into the full, the, full, uh, the full contract and start a full implementation. If you can bubble up those lessons learned earlier in the process, you're gonna be much, much better off. Again, the key to a, to a, a bake off done right is to make it real. So again, I want you to go back to those real scenarios. So typically we take, take that set of scenarios that we created for the RFP in, demo, in demos and pare it down to a, a, usually a more manageable set of scenarios. And we say, we might provide some real content to, to work with. We get real people to, to interact with the, with the team and we set them up in real environments as much as possible. And you mimic a real implementation as much as you can. People always tell me, when, when we suggest this to clients, they say, oh my gosh, it's gonna cost too much. We can't, we can't have people out of work for this amount of time, take them out of their real jobs and, and apply them to a big up. And I, and I get that. I mean, that's, that's, that's reality and I, and I get it. I will say, though, again, I'll harken back, the most successful projects are the ones that did put in the time here. So if you could balance that off with, with the cost of, of a failed implementation, it, it can be worth it. Now, you gotta be a little bit flexible here. I get it, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be realistic here. I don't want to be on my high horse here and say, everyone needs to do a six month bake off and stop, or stop whatever you're doing and do a bake off. No, that's not real. But, um, you know, it, at a minimum, you need to do a proof of concept. So if you, while we recommend doing a competitive proof of concept, at a minimum, take your leader and before you sign on to that full contract, do a, um, do a, do a true proof of concept to at least understand the basics, understand what it's like to work with them, but maybe even truly prove out some, some last gotcha items um, in, the, in the vein of a true, true proof of concept as well. Perfect. So what we're doing here is crafting a, a, an approach here that's, that's iterative. And by iterative, I mean you're, you're, you're sketching some requirements at the outset, but in the form of scenario. So it's not this perfect list of requirements. It's, it's slightly imperfect, but as you go through these steps and as you get closer and closer to a decision, what you're doing is you're learning about what's possible from these vendors. You're also learning what you are capable of uh, as an organization. I think, you know, it, it's so interesting to me to see this approach actually take place where you know, the traditional approach of going across that organization, gathering all those, that laundry list of requirements, what you, you end up doing is you, you go to this one group, you get their 10 requirements, go to the next group, get their 10, their 50, their 10, their 15, and the, those groups end up only caring about those 50 or 15 or 10 line items, right? They don't see the big picture. You take the approach where you describe that future way of working across different parts of the organization, People, even very early in, in the process, almost week one, when you, when you get these scenarios down on paper and you, and you start to, to communicate that to the larger team, people say, oh, I get it. 
That's what we're buying? Oh, that's great. So that, yeah, that'll, I, we need that. You know, and they, they, they truly start getting it. And it, it almost like, it's almost the first step in the change management process because you've heard, you've heard their needs and you say, this is part of a bigger solution though. And, and this is, we're all moving on the same, on the, in the same direction on the same page. But the learning doesn't stop there. As you go through this process, you're, again, learning what's capable of the, of, from the vendors, learning about yourselves and what you really need, what's most important uh, to you, and you're able to refine over time. So those initial set of scenarios become a subset as you get to the, the latter stages, and you can say, okay, well, these are what is most important to us. Let's, let's really hone in on this. So ultimately here, what we're talking about is fit. So, you, I hearken on this quite a bit today, and you know, scenario fit is, is really essential here. But you're also assessing how good of a technology fit it is in your, in your larger ecosystem. You can't divorce the fact that you're ultimately, when you bring a new technology, you're bringing on a new partner. And this is a partnership, so there's people involved. And, and I can't tell you how many times people divorce the people side of this process from just, they think about it just as the tech, just from the technology perspective, and that, you can't do that. And then, of course, the value fit. These things are, tend to be pretty expensive. Whether the list price on the technology is, is ex expensive, and it, it can be or it can't be, um, but there's a lot of other costs that, that go into this as well, and, and so you need to be assessing how good of a value fit is this for us at every step of the way as well. The Nielsen Norman Group, a, a, a user experience um, uh, firm, they, they talk about design thinking. They say there's three significant components of common ground in teams, a shared vocabulary, tangible artifacts, and a trust-based team culture. And so when we look at this process that I'm suggesting to you today is the right way to select technology. When I think of shared vocabulary, I think about that common set of scenarios that we're all marching towards. When I think of tangible artifacts, I think about the, um, the actual demos that are unique to us, the proof of concept deliverables that mimic the real, a real project that isn't throwaway. This is real, tangible uh, deliverables. And the trust-based team culture goes back to we heard from people across the organization. We tried to, uh, tried to think about how they want to work. We put that in the scenarios. We, we didn't treat them as line items, and we made them uh, really feel like they're, they're heard and, and, and part of this process. So if the traditional way of selecting technology is spending a lots of time up front gathering all those requirements, spending some time on the RFP, proposals and demos, and then crossing over to a, a, big, um, a big implementation project and, and, and more requirement uh, specifications and then, and then a big bang implementation, what I'm suggesting is spend a little bit, time, little bit less time on requirements, so more time on, on use case scenarios and, and more time testing, testing, testing in here, T continue your testing in your bake-off. That bake-off, again, is not a waste of time. That is real, real, um, real code, real deliverables that oftentimes we see translates really nicely into a live pilot. So you can, that, that difference in what you create here to, a, to something you can actually deliver to the organization is not that great of a, of a jump and, and that can give you some really quick wins. And, and, and when, you're, when you're saying we're, we're about to embark on this journey, to start showing some quick wins along the way is, is, can be really uh, in your favor. And then obviously a more traditional approach to implementation today is to do this in, in not a big bang approach but more phased implementation and we found that this process lends itself nicely to, to uh, transitioning in, into, into that as well. Going back to Jacob Nielsen, he, he likes to use the phrase, a wonderful interface solving the wrong problem will fail. So we've taken up the, this notion at Real Story Group that wonderful technology solving the wrong problem will also fail. There's a lot of wonderful technology out there. It's up to you to find the right technology for what it is you're trying to do. With that, do we have any questions? Yeah, oh, yeah, and while you're thinking about questions, if, if you all just, if anyone wants a book, uh, if you give me a business card or write your name and email on a, on a, on a piece of paper. For those of you who don't get the book, I'll send you a, I'll send you a link to the, the digital copy of the, of the book. So, any questions while we, while we do that? Yes? Uh, your definition of free 
Yep. Yeah. So, and just so I'm clear, are you? Do you have multiple technology vendors doing this, or just one? So it's just one. Just one. Okay. So. Okay. So the question here is, this gentleman has one technology vendor in the mix, and they're, they're really doing a proof of concept, that, but it might be more of a, a, live, or a live pilot. pilot. So I guess where, where, I cro where I cross the line is, have you signed a contract yet? <laughs> right? Because what I want you to do is I want you to do that proof of concept for as little money as possible. OK? So, in your world, I want you to do the proof of concept before you sign a contract, or ha give yourself an out, at least, to say, if you're going to do it with us, if we choose not to go with you, we get our money back. Or, or, or you negotiate a kill fee or something like that, so uh, you know, lower than, than maybe their rack rates. Um, but if we do go ahead with you, um, we can just take what we've, we've done and roll it into a, a larger project. So that's the, the key differentiator in my mind is, are you doing this pre-contract or, or after contract? Yeah, so great question. So the question is around how do we, how do we determine what's in the scenario and, and, and should you focus on current state or future state? Um, in my mind, I want you to focus a little bit more on the future. Okay, so, but, but don't ignore the stuff that's flopping <laughs> because, because the stuff that's flopping is the stuff that you probably should pay a lot of attention to and say, okay, how do we want this to work better in the future, right? And, and, what you determine as a team, start to say, all right, let's not, let's not prescribe every step of the way, but let's talk about, in a perfect world, what information needs to flow where to make the right decisions so that people can do, do their jobs. And let's just describe that. That's what should go in those scenarios. You know, you describe that future state, and then the vendor's gonna come to the table and say, here's how my solution solves that problem that you described. And they will have de very different ways of solving a, a single problem. And that's what you want to see. Now, there is a bit of art and science to that. I, I will say, you know, we, we do this all the time, and and we we tend to highlight things that that we know different vendors do very differently. You know, different vendors again come at a, a very similar problem in very different ways, and we want you as buyers to see that. So when we're working with our clients, we highlight those and make sure those are represented in those scenarios, so that you can be that educated buyer and make the right decisions by saying, "Well, that way works better for us." But, um, but yeah, focus on the future, ideal ways of, that you'd like to work, and, and leave it to them to come to the table. Other questions? Yes. It's a great question. <laughs> um, so there is a balance here. You're right. So the question is, how do you know? How do you know you're, you you put enough into your scenarios? Really, is what you're right. It, like, um, and I don't know if you ever know you're done. Even if you were going out and, and doing it the, the traditional way and, and trying to, uh, to to gather every single requirement, I don't know if anyone ever knows if they're done if they have all the requirements there. So. I don't have a great answer for you, but I want you to hone in on the things that make your situation unique. Make sure those are captured in the, in, the, in the scenarios. And then there's a lot of commodity type requirements that will come out in this process that if you didn't capture them, eh, it's not that big a deal. You'll get it when you, when you do the implementation. But from the, from the point of getting to the right vendor, you don't need to have everything. You need to get it, find the, the key big things that make you unique, that will get you to that, to, that, to that vendor and then you can design the system after that. Yes? I just wanted to add on, wouldn't it be when you have a consensus of organization? Uh, sure, a absolutely, that's, that's part of it. Yeah, you, these, the, and these scenarios are a great way to, again, go back to your decision makers and get that s consensus. Because, you know, I mentioned before, every, everyone looks at those laundry list requirements and, and 
not only do you not understand what you're buying, but your leadership doesn't understand what you're buying either. So this is a great way to communicate back up the chain too, to say, hey, this is what we're doing. And here, here's, here's, the, here's our future plan, and, and they're gonna poke holes in it and, and hopefully agree with it, and, and yeah, absolutely. These aren't things that just, we just throw over the wall and, and, and use in isolation. This is a, a, these scenarios are a great communication tool within your organization, and, and uh, if done right, can really in, improve your chances of success right from the, from the outset, so yeah, great point. Anything else? All right, let's do a, a quick, I got three of them here. Oh, wait, anyone else? Anyone else? Okay. Oh, last minute entries. You guys are like after hours voters or something. Oh, yeah. I don't know. We got some mail in ballots. What do we got? I'll do a couple of business cards. People still have business cards. This is awesome. All right. We have Warren Williams. Where's Warren? You would not believe that I just said I never win anything. You never win anything. Well, oh, today's your lucky day. Keith Austin and Nadine. Oh, look at you. Oh, my gosh. It's always the way. And the rest of you, I will follow up with an email and get you a digital copy if you're interested. 57 hey. years, never won 57? Oh, my gosh. Give him a round of applause. Come on. <laughs> I hope I didn't disappoint you. It's not the most exciting book. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate it. And uh, I encourage you to stick around because Rebecca Rogers, if you haven't seen her speak, she's phenomenal. She's all the way here from Australia. So she made, she made the effort. So stick around. Her presentation is going to be great. Thank you.